Good evening to our UCD alumni and friends tuning in this evening. I'm delighted to extend a very warm welcome to this special online celebration of the UCD Alumni Awards 2020. Our 300,000 global alumni network in 184 countries is richly diverse and impressively far-reaching and is one of our greatest assets. It's fitting that we should honour the wonderful achievements of some of our most successful graduates annually. An outstanding UCD education has been the launch pad for leaders, influencers and innovators all over the world who are using their talents, intellect and creativity to change our global society for the better. The annual UCD Alumni Awards dinner in O'Reilly Hall is normally one of the highlights of the university alumni calendar. This year, unfortunately, the extraordinary circumstances of the global pandemic dictate that we move our celebration to an online format. Notwithstanding the difficulties of the past eight months, our graduates and university community have rallied in the face of adversity. And I know that you are all with me in spirit as I warmly congratulate the 2020 UCD Alumni Awardees. This year, the award for Arts and Humanities goes to Dalton Phillips. The award for Business goes to Mark Pollock. And for Engineering and Architecture, it goes to Roisin Hennigan. Our awardee for Health and Agricultural Sciences is Professor Delia Grace Randolph. And for Law, Sally Hayden takes the award. For Research, Innovation and Impact, the award goes to Dr Sandra Collins. And for Science, Dr Cormac Kilty is our awardee. Finally, the award for Social Sciences goes to Sharon Donnery. And for Sport, Dr Jack McCaffrey takes the award. Each of these individuals embodies UCD's pursuit of excellence and is an inspiration to us all. They are incredible role models for the present and future generations of UCD students who will seek to follow in their illustrious footsteps and make their own mark on the world. This year's celebration takes the format of four webinar conversations, each reflecting one of the pillars of UCD's Rising to the Future strategy. Our award winners will be grouped across these four events for engaging discussions on the themes of business, health, resilience and innovation. I'd also like to thank our strategic partners, our academic leaders and friends for their support on this special occasion. I extend my congratulations once again to our Alumni Award 2020 winners and I look forward to welcoming you to campus in the future to celebrate in person. Thank you, President. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the UCD Alumni Awards in Focus conversation series. Unfortunately, given the situation with the pandemic, the UCD Alumni Awards Gala Dinner cannot take place as an in-person event this year. However, we're delighted to have in its place a virtual webinar series that will celebrate nine of UCD's outstanding alumni awardees throughout the month of November. We're delighted to welcome our UCD alumni community from all around the world to hear from nine of UCD's most notable alumni and showcase the breadth and depth of UCD's leading programs. The four UCD alumni awardees in Focus Conversations will reflect the four strategic themes of UCD's strategy entitled Rising to the Future. And these four are creating a sustainable global society, building a healthy world, Thirdly, empowering humanity. And lastly, transforming through digital technology. Digital technology is at the center of economic development due to its wide use during the COVID-19 outbreak. While there's no doubt that the pandemic is amplifying the adoption of new technologies, technological advancements were already changing the world over the past two decades. Our UCD alumni awardees in Focus Conversation will feature two awardees who stepped up to the opportunities offered by digital technology and have been driving innovation through digital transformation for many, many years now. Without further ado, allow me to introduce you to tonight's UCD alumni awardees. 
Roshin Heenan co-founded the firm Heenan Peng in 1999 in New York City, and two years later, they moved to Dublin. They've designed many cultural buildings and museums. Heenan Peng was awarded one of the world's most coveted commissions, designing the Grand Egyptian Museum outside Cairo, north of the pyramids at Giza. Apparently, the small Dublin architecture practice secured the job by beating more than 1,500 practices from 83 countries in an international competition. Dr. Sandra Collins is director of the National Library of Ireland, and she's overseen many milestones since her appointment as director five years ago, including significant digitization projects and the opening of the new Museum of Literature Ireland, Molly, at Newman House in partnership with UCD. Sandra is leading capital redevelopment work to ensure that the National Library remains one of our preeminent national cultural institutions. But before we start the conversations, you'll hear from UCD College Principal for the College of Engineering and Architecture, Professor Aoife Ahern, and Vice President for Research, Innovation and Impact, Professor Orla Feely, about their two awardees. So the 2020 Alumni Award from the College of Engineering and Architecture is Roisin Hennigan. Roisin graduated in 1987 from UCD with a Bachelor of Architecture and then went on to do a Master's of Architecture in Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Roisin is being recognised for her illustrious career in architecture. She is a co-founder of Hennigan Peng Architects who are based in Berlin and Dublin and have a diverse portfolio of work. That work includes the Visitor Centre at the Giant Causeway in Northern Ireland, the Historic Wing at the National Gallery here in Dublin, and also the Library and School of Architecture in the University of Greenwich. Roisin's impact on the world of architecture has been huge. Through Hennigan's Peng's work, where they have won a number of international awards, including for the Grand Egyptian Museum and for the Canadian Museum of Canoes in Ontario. Roisin has also had a very big impact on the lives of students and on our future architects through her teaching and lecturing, most recently at Yale University. Roisin was also involved in many international juries, including the Reba Sterling Award in 2016. The recipient of the UCD Alumni Award in Research, Innovation and Impact for 2020 is Dr. Sandra Collins. Sandra studied mathematics and applied mathematics in UCD and went on to obtain a PhD in nonlinear fluid dynamics in 1996. Sandra has had a really interesting and diverse career to this point. She started off lecturing in DCU and working as a researcher in Ericsson Telecommunications. She joined Science Foundation Ireland where she worked as a scientific program manager. From there she went to head up the Digital Repository of Ireland in the Royal Irish Academy and she's now director of the National Library of Ireland, one of our great cultural institutions. So in marking Sandra's achievements, we are marking the role of libraries in research, innovation and impact, and of those who lead them and those who work in libraries. We're also recognising the great collaboration that we have in UCD with the National Library of Ireland, particularly in Molly, the Museum of Literature Ireland on St Stephen's Green, a wonderful initiative led by our two institutions in which we take such pride. Dr. Sandra Collins and Roisin Heenan, you're very welcome to our webinar. Um, let me start with you, uh, Sandra. How did your time in UCD influence your career path? Well, I went to UCD to study science. I had in mind to be a particle physicist, um, but I discovered maths in my first year and that was such a love. Like, so I just really, really fell in love with that subject. And I guess then over the years since then, it's always stood with me. It's been a part of how I approach problems, how I think about things. And um, yeah, that sort of growing in independence and research was really a key part of UCD and something that has stood to me ever since. Now, the caricature of someone who's into mathematics would be that they go into engineering or some such subject. You, on the other hand, are in charge of the National Library. So how does that come about? 
how did that happen? I sometimes wonder that myself. Um, so I suppose really what um, people talk about mathematics being a language of life and so on. Um, and throughout, um, I, I, I've had quite a varied career. So I worked in um, uh, academia and then in telecommunications. Um, I worked in Science Foundation Ireland. But I think throughout all that, it's um, a love of research and that the research is important and it's impactful that there's digital and innovation in there um, and then in my heart I just always loved Irish culture heritage literature history so um, to be um, as lucky and as privileged as I am to have this role as director of the National Library brings together so many things I love and the work in the library is like it's just driven by research and innovation and um, we have a huge digital agenda at the moment. So um, in many ways, it's a big surprise. I often kick myself when I wake up. I can't believe how lucky I am. But in many other ways, it's the bringing together of so many different pieces um, that have just um, uh, come together in the National Library. Now, Roshi, tell me about your journey from UCD to the point where uh, your firm is involved in the greatest museum project of the 21st century. So how did it all start in UCD? Well, I suppose I studied architecture there. Um, so, you know, maybe as opposed to Sandra, it's a more, um, it's more directed in that uh, the, you know, it's an architecture program of study. Um, and I suppose maybe the things that were really important were, um, um, the 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 teaching staff and the people that uh, that I met there um, after UCD I went on to do a further study I was in New York and um, we're always interested in in looking around the world doing different competitions which is how we ended up doing the Egyptian Museum competition which we won now as a student in UCD uh, you were looking around at a campus that was evolving with lots of new buildings all around you. Now, to what extent were you saying, I could do better than that? Um, I, I mean, when I was there, it was very much the original campus. A lot of the transformation kept a bit, uh, came a little bit later. So um, it was very open, if you like, at the time. Um, I would say that probably in terms of thinking about I, I could do better, it we were maybe a bit more focused on the city uh, and the conversations we say around the centre of Dublin at the time and how that could become more of a, a living city uh, where uh, the centre had been quite hollowed out. There was a lot of uh, derelict buildings. And then of course, later on, there was a whole lot of rebuilding in the 1990s. But I think when I was in UCD, it was when um, a lot of those conversations about how can the city become a more active space. Um, that, that was a lot and, and yet you, you go to live in New York, which has a massive density of population, and it shows how city living up to the pandemic can really work for so many people in a very enjoyable way. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, New York is, is a completely different way of living. You start to understand how the city space works to support living in that density. And that's also when I met my husband, Shifu, who is uh, from Taiwan. And again, you see a much denser way of living, but where the city actually supports that density. So it, it is kind of eye-opening from the, the model of you have to have a house with a garden to how can you actually actively live in a city? And it's kind of interesting in Asia right now, like Hong Kong, Taipei, incredibly dense cities that are actually doing very well during the pandemic. So I don't think density really is the issue here. Now, Sandra, we think of the National Library, we think of, uh, you know, fairly mature Victorian buildings and books, loads and loads of books. And libraries have been portals of learning. But now people have, at their fingertips on a keyboard, access to a digital portal of learning. So you must ask yourself, you know, what future does a building 
that facilitates reading, for example, that facilitates physical research? What future does it have in a world where more and more people are doing everything from their desk at home? Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's um, what I think is the most exciting thing for libraries is um, being able to have both those experiences, the digital and the physical. So I would like to think that we're a real leader in digital innovation and information science. We have digitized our collections. We provide online resources. We have people, for example, um, we digitise photos from the national collections um, capturing all aspects of Irish life over the centuries. And we publish those online using Flickr. And we have millions of visits from around the world of people coming and looking at the digitised image and saying, well, I know who that is or I recognise that house. And um, I can tell you what the story of that photo is. And we gather up all that information and add that into the national collections. So that is a way in which the really fundamental physical thing, maybe it's a glass plate photo, it's a, um, you know, it, it, it could be very old. And we've added all those, um, uh, the research, the connection with local community, people engaging with that. And that wouldn't be possible for us if we couldn't digitize it and give access to it on the internet. So um, I, what, I, I guess, one of the things I really love is um, the physical experience, like people love our buildings, they love to be in the presence of the real original artifact, the object, there's a reverence to that, but the digital allows us to reach so many people and gives us um, just a whole new way of working. It also brings new challenges as well. Um, so the other thing we need to think about, we collect everything. We collect all um, aspects of Irish life. And because in a hundred years from now, you don't know what will be the important thing that people, researchers, people will want to engage with. So that has to include all the digital material that we create nowadays as well. So that's one of the real, um, like big issues for libraries around the world, born digital material like websites, like um, digital photography, like emails and Twitter, all these materials that have no paper-based equivalent, we need to collect and preserve those as well. So we're kept busy. Now, any of us uh, of a certain age will remember um, recorded music. Um, I remember when I first joined RTE years ago, I saw a wax cylinder uh, where music was recorded. Then, of course, there were 78s made of shellac, and then we got vinyl, and then we got uh, cassette tapes and CDs, and ultimately now it's all digital music. How do you future-proof what you do for the generations to come? Yeah, so that's that's a um, that's really the the question of the moment. So, and um, that's digital preservation. And if you think of what we do with our paper-based materials, you think a hundred-year-old newspaper is pretty hard to conserve and keep safe. And the digital material is so much more fragile, like it is a real challenge. And the reason it's tricky is because it changes so quickly. So you're talking about the evolution of music there. And um, if you like, nobody writes letters anymore. Well, I hope they do, but we see an awful lot more emails, don't we? And maybe instead of um, birthday cards, people are putting messages up on Facebook and so on. So there's a huge amount of um, both personal, public memories, important documents, all created digitally. And to preserve those, is, is, it, it is as important to preserve those as it is to preserve our Gaelic manuscripts. You know, 100, 200, 300 years from now, people will want to be able to engage with that material. So that's, that's quite a technical process. It really is a huge amount of digital innovation and um, being able to recreate that experience, that authentic experience that people have the first time they encounter something digitally, like a digital photo, an email, a diary entry, um, give people in the future that same experience and to keep it safe. So we say no. paper rots, that's terrible, but bits and bytes rot as well. It's as big a job. And the same is true in your practice, uh, Roisin. I mean, you uh, embraced computer-aided design, tried to create the paperless office. You know, no more blueprints and big drawing boards. Everything could be done on screens. Um, and yet, we often watch the telly and 
there's some crime committed somewhere and the FBI come in and they say, get us the drawings of the seller so we know how to you know, catch the bad guys. Um, what happens to the records now of the built environment? I mean, the testimony to your work is the built environment, but what happens to the, the, the records of that? Um, yeah, it's, it's actually, again, it's an interesting problem. We had, um, I worked in an office where we had a situation that backups couldn't be accessed because the recording, the device to open it was no longer available. Um, so, but I think technology, well, we, we now have PDF, so we, we keep everything digitally in, in that format. Um, I, I hope that all the readers will be back uh, dated so that uh, a 19 or 2020 version will be openable in 2050 because that really is is the problem. It's uh, the technology moves on, but it's not backward compatible all the time. Um, now, yeah, tell me. Okay, so we do have the buildings. So. Yeah, but yeah, and and one of the greatest buildings of your lifetime, I'm sure is going to be the Grand Museum in, in Egypt, just outside Cairo, um, at, the, at Giza, where the, uh, the, the, the Great Pyramids are and the Sphinx and all of that. How does a practice like yours win such a commission, which is hundreds of millions of euros worth of business? Um, it was an open competition. So in architecture, that happens. The Sydney Opera House is done that way. Um, so we sent five drawings in through the post and um, we were one of 20 and then we needed a bigger team and we won the final one but it was anonymous so uh, the jury pick a winner and then you figure out how to do it. <laughs> you make it sound so simple because you, when you mentioned the Sydney Opera House I remember at the time after the the design was chosen they found that they could not build it and it took the development of a lot more software to enable them to plan the engineering drawings that ultimately allowed it to be built. So in terms of your entry into this competition for the great museum in Egypt, um, I presume you checked it could be built before you sent in the suggestions. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 it could bro broadly be built. I mean. Everything is, uh, you know, in, in a big competition like that, of course, it's ambitious. And uh, we had an engineer, we had a great engineering team. Uh, and, and then, of course, there, there were years of work to develop the design. Um, when you uh, enter a competition like this and you win, and it turns out that you're a company from outside their jurisdiction and not even a company that might be writ large on the global architectural map, um, do you ever worry that someone's going to try and take it from you? Uh, no, we didn't worry about that. Uh, we worried about how are we going to do it. Uh, so, uh, but actually people are really helpful. Uh, I called up uh, the Architects Who Designed the Alexandria Library, uh, who are also a young practice that won the competition. They were Los Angeles and Norway. And uh, they were really helpful. They said they connected us with some project managers and then, you know, we eventually kind of established a network. And uh, yeah, we found our way into doing it. So uh, there's, uh, now, there's a lot of help. So many people have gone on virtual tours of exhibits during the pandemic, during lockdown, whether it's to the Louvre or the Vatican or wherever it might be. And it, people began to question the value of having maybe these huge places where people might actually not physically go anymore. Now, I don't think that's going to happen in the case of uh, the, the Grand Museum in Egypt because there are so many wonderful things to see. But did you ever question its, its grandeur, its size, its scope? Um, that, that was a conversation that uh, the museum posed back in 20, 2003 when the museum was being built. Um, so they have a vast collection, an enormous collection, and a fraction of it is, uh, is going to be exhibited. Um, and there are a lot of Egyptian artifacts all over the world, like Nefertiti. So, so that, was, that was always going to be an issue. It's not as if you go to Egypt and you see all of the collection, you know, it, it's everywhere. Um, 
I think that Sandra was saying that there's an amazing resource in being able to get online and see all of this, but nothing, you know, nothing can transcend actually seeing the the piece itself and um, you know seeing the Tutankhamun collection, seeing it, you know, it, it's adjacent. You can actually see the pyramids if you look out the window at the same time, being in that place, it, it's it's transformative compared to just seeing it online. So online enhances and it's a wonderful resource, but compared to seeing the pieces, I, I, I still believe that people will, will want to see it. And in fact, I think it'll increase the audience because more people will be aware through the online experience of what there is out there. Hmm. Did you get to see the old Cairo Museum where the Tutankhamun collection was because I saw it years ago uh, guarded by a man uh, with a rifle and no socks but boots and he had a sublime indifference to the collection but myself and my friends who went to see it we were blown away by how modern the, the, the design sensibility seemed to be to us so I've no doubt once people understand that they will flock to your new museum. Yeah, I, think, I mean, the uh, Old Cairo Museum is a wonderful, wonderful building. Love it uh, and love the but. way the collection is displayed. <laughs> yeah, but it, it needed some work. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think a lot of people will go. It's an amazing collection. Yeah. Now, uh, the, the fact that tourism has been limited, uh, how does that impact the, the uh, success of the museum initially? I mean, it is uh, formally finished now. I don't know whether and when it will open for for visitors. Can you tell us? I think it's going to be next year uh, okay. that it's going to be open because I mean the the installation of the exhibition alone is a huge undertaking. Um, so yeah I, I've heard next year. And I should go back to you Sandra about the, the National Library and again the same question about the relevance of places to go when everything is online you know, do you need to keep your doors open, for example? Do you need to have staff that deal exclusively with the public when so much is done online? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question and, and great to hear um, Roisin talk about it as well. So I think we can have the best of both worlds. Um, with our, um, there's aspects of digital that the physical can't replace because there is no equivalent like collections of websites and social media and so on. Um, and providing access to those, to researchers, to people, even collecting things like COVID-19, the experience of that. And um, so much of it is captured digitally, but, um, but we should have the best of both. There is something very special about being in a place and having the experience of knowing that you're with an object that carries all its history with it. So it tells its own story. Um, our partnerships so the National Library um, partnered with UCD to create Molly, the Museum of Literature Ireland and um, that's in Newman House it's a new um, Irish museum and that was really important to us to have a new physical space and this partnership with a huge academic organization to have create new audiences and new ways to show off the national collections and the bit that stays with me the most out of uh, the design um, and the experience of Molly is we have copy number one of Ulysses at the very top of the building. So you travel through everything. You have the experience of all, you know, Dublin and Irish literature, so, so much, like so many fabulous things there. But right at the end of your journey, at the very top of the building, um, this beautiful display with copy number one of Ulysses. And um, you, you couldn't replace that. You know, there's just something really special about being in a place. And I think um, definitely our feedback. So um, the National Library, the doors are closed um, in level five. So many of us were working from home. But our feedback is that people have found um, like solace and comfort in the spaces and, and, and they miss that and they want to get back to it. And, and that's what we want as well. So I, let's have both. All right, in, in terms of uh, where your careers have, have taken you all, I mean, Roisin, there are some architects who will spend their lives uh, maybe designing one-off houses in the countryside or small housing estates 
And then there are people like yourself whose ambition is writ larger on the world. What would you say to, to young people embarking on a career? Because it seems to me that you can't do it unless you dream it first. Um, yes, uh, I would. Well, I think that there's a place for everybody. Like for some people doing a wonderful house, doing wonderful housing, that is very important and that should be done very well. So I think it's you need to find what you want to do. But then I'd say is th there's so much, there's so many ways you can be discouraged. It's just to keep going because it's always kind of struck me that we did all these competitions and we lost so many competitions, so many. People always think that we won competitions, but we lost years and years of them. It's just to keep going. Because it's just when you think, oh, you know, this is it. Just as you're at the lowest point, usually something comes. So I, I, that would be my, just keep going. Don't give up. I, and, and that's the point. Now that you've won this massive competition for a, a hugely important building, are you back to square one with the next competition? Or yes. are you a shoe in for some things because of, of this achievement? No, 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 no. We, we go back to the bottom of the pile. I mean, we won that competition in 2003 and we have folders and folders of uh, also rands, uh, which, you know, like sometimes when, when we travel to different places, I kind of see a side and say, oh, we did a competition there, like in Brussels, in wherever, around the world. I kind of, I see the world through all of these failed competitions. But as well as that, of course, you learn each time because when you're doing something, it becomes, you know, a possibility and uh, you get to know about the place. And so it's also kind of a, a geography of the world. But I, I bet you sometimes say, Ours was better than that one that they actually of built. <laughs> of, <laughs> of course. course. Of course. And, and Sandra, your, your advice to people who may be starting out in, in mathematics uh, and may find themselves less than fully satisfied by the journey they're on, what would you say? Yeah, so actually I say just keep going an awful lot as well, Roshi. <laughs> um, but I think my, my my big advice is to be brave and 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 to go for it. I mean, um, I suppose in having changed sectors and, and, and worked in the private, the public sector, and, and just every time you move, you start again in many ways from scratch. And, it, you know, it's hard. It's hard to start again. Um, but it's it's been the most rewarding experience as well. So I think I would say to graduates starting out and indeed to um, uh, uh, school children making their decision about what to do in college, be brave, pursue it, go for it. Like, don't, don't, don't be held back. Um, I, 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 I feel the same as Roisin. You get setbacks along the way. Things don't go the way you mean to. But it's all part of this um you know the the growth in yourself and 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 if you if you keep going and you're brave um good things will follow that what an inspiring conversation uh, dr sandra collins and roshin heenan thank you very much for joining us today thank you thank you roshin and sandra for a wonderful conversation and a special thanks to all of you for being with us this evening this brings to a close our UCD Alumni Awardees In Focus series. My thanks to all nine awardees who've taken the time to join us for such fantastic conversations. And I would like to congratulate each once again on their awards. If you missed any of the series, they will be available to watch back. Please visit the UCD Alumni Awards website for further details. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce Nicole Black, Director of Alumni Development, to say a few words. Stay safe and well. What an absolutely fascinating conversation. I hope you found that as interesting and thought provoking as I did. It's a real privilege to know that our UCD alumni are driving such important change and helping to shape the world beyond COVID-19 for future generations. I'd like to thank our awardees this evening for giving so generously of their time to share their UCD experience, insight and inspirational achievements with us. In this exceptionally difficult period, we know our awardees have many demands on their time right now, and we are delighted they were able to join with us tonight. Our alumni are the backbone of this great institution, and despite these challenging times, we are more committed than ever to strengthening the links our alumni have forged with both UCD and each other through our alumni programme of online events and celebrations such as tonight. 
While we can't unfortunately all be together in person, it is still so important to celebrate our alumni's achievements and through them show the breadth of impact UCD alumni continue to make all over the world. Our 2020 UCD alumni awardees are truly some of our brightest and best and we are delighted to have been able to showcase them in tonight's very special webinar. As ever, a big thank you to the wonderful Pat Kenny, a fellow alumnus and dear friend of UCD, for hosting the conversation for us again. The awards may look a little bit different this year, but they just wouldn't be the same without you, Pat. A huge thank you as well to all the alumni team behind the scenes for helping to reimagine this year's awards under difficult and often ever-changing circumstances ensuring that this important celebration could still go ahead. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight in helping to celebrate our outstanding awardees and being proud of what makes the UCD Alumni Awards such a special event for all of us. As we close tonight's event, it just remains for me to wish all of you, wherever you are from, all the very best for joining us in these incredibly difficult times. Please stay safe and well, and we look forward to welcoming you to more upcoming events with UCD. From all of us, take care and good night.